Let me announce our speaker for the day so that we can hear from our speaker. There's no mic here. Okay. I'm very pleased to be able to have Richard Askey, who's a professor of emeritus of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, as our guest speaker. I was very fortunate to be able to get him as part of his coming here to speak to the mathematics department and others, math mathematics department and others connected with the department on other issues, and he was able to be here for our Friday seminar that would be related to the ongoing discussions we have about educational policy. His talk, as you can see, is going to be on content knowledge for teachers. Richard Askey has worked on special functions, which are higher versions, and they were higher versions of the trigonometric, exponential, logarithmic, log logarithmic functions that occur in school mathematics. I'm sorry, I can pronounce these words. Based on this work, he was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. However, he has done and is still doing other work which is more closely related to the talk today. And I have become acquainted with Richard Askey over the past 10 years with regard to the work that he's done in looking at school textbooks and teacher training issues and other issues related to K-12 math education. He's helped a few states write standards. He's been an advisor to some publishers and was an invited reviewer of many reports in mathematics education, such as Adding It Up, and the report of the National Mathematics Advisory <laughs> Panel, and received a Smith Award for Distinguished Teaching. He has written articles for the American Educator on elementary mathematics issues, and he's also written something for the mathematics teacher, as sponsored by the NCTM. I am really glad to have somebody who has been involved in the issues in K-12 mathematics education from the vantage point of someone who truly understands the content of mathematics and can then give us a way of looking at some of these issues from a very deep knowledge of the content, which is a good part of the question that we face as we think about national content standards and where we are able to go from them as they are being worked out right now in the next couple of months. Let me have Richard Askey come up and give us his talk on teachers' content knowledge. Well, thank you, Sandy. <laughs> we met once before. There was a meeting at uh, Kennedy School at Harvard on education wars. Uh, a day on reading and a day on math, and I went a day early so that I could hear what was going on in reading, as well as what was going on in mathematics. Lee Shulman is retired now uh, as President Emeritus of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning. I got to know him through a student of his named Lee Ping Ma who wrote a marvelous book, Knowing and Teaching Elementary Mathematics, which I would recommend to everybody. He was president of the American Education Research Association 25 years ago, and his presidential address is well worth reading, and if you haven't read it, I would strongly recommend it. The one thing in that address that was picked up by the education establishment was the phrase pedagogical content knowledge, the, con the knowledge of content so that it would make it easier for our students to learn. But that isn't what he started with. Here's the start of his talk. We begin our inquiry in the conceptions of teacher knowledge with the tests for teachers that were used in this country during the last century at state and county levels. That's the 19th century because this was published in 18, 1985. After mentioning some current people who wanted such tests, including Bill Duck Clinton, then governor of Arkansas, Shulman wrote, like most of good ideas, however, its roots are much older. And then he illustrated this with some questions 
from California County Exams from 1875. I'll give you a list of the areas in which questions were asked. Uh, Shulman said the, the exams took one day. He's wrong. The exams took three days. There were 20 areas. Three of them in mathematics, arithmetic, mental arithmetic, and algebra. There was also some geometry included in that. But here's a mental arithmetic problem. Divide 88 into two such parts that, that shall be to each other as two-thirds is to four-fifths. Now, when I started teaching this section of our course in arithmetic for prospective elementary school teachers, after I taught it once, I realized I didn't know what they knew and what they didn't know at the beginning. And you need to know that to structure a course well. So I devised a diagnostic test. Used mostly items that were released from the 1995 Third International Math and Science Study, eighth grade test. Uh, the people who were taking this uh, had all had three years of high school math. Uh, there was one non Tim's question, uh, sixth grade Singapore multi step word problem. The average was a little bit above the national average on all questions, but usually not significantly above that. Um, later, I put this question on. 26 people took the, that particular example that, that I gave, that test that I gave that semester. Two got this problem correct. One did it by algebra, and one did it by guess and check. But this was listed as a metal math problem. And so how would one do something like this? Well, to compare two-thirds and four-fifths, the simplest way to do it is to put them to the same unit. And the unit that you would use would be one-fifteenth. So two-thirds is ten-fifteenths, and four-fifths is twelve-fifteenths. So two-thirds is to four-fifths as ten-fifteenths is to twelve-fifteenths, or ten is to twelve. And so that's ten out of twenty-two. And then multiplying by 4, it's 40 out of 88. So in fact, it is a mental math problem. And it's a kind of problem that we want students to learn how to do before they get to algebra. Because this is good preparation for algebra. Learning how to work flexibly with numbers and to learn how to read and translate word problems into arithmetic is important. But he didn't only give examples, and I was a, a bit slow, I am sometimes, and I read Shulman's article five years before I realized that I needed to find examples of these questions beyond what he had in his test, that he had in his article. And so I started asking around, and I found out the person who had been his research associate who had found these for him. I won't mention who, but she didn't remember where she'd gotten them. Uh, and it took uh, a few more years, it took about five years, before somebody suggested they're probably at the Stanford Library. Lee was uh, a professor at Stanford at the time. And gave me the name of a librarian there, and I wrote her, and yes, indeed, they did have them. And she sent me a Xerox copy of the exams from 1874, 73, and 75. When I got it, a while after that, it suddenly dawned on me that these came from state superintendent reports. And the Wisconsin Historical Society that's right on the campus in Madison, right down at the bottom of Bascom Hill, mathematics is at the top of it, and it's just across the street from that, has an enormous collection of state superintendent reports going back to the 1860s, 1870s, and then up. And they're very, very interesting reading. I can recommend it. There are a few of them on the web. There will be more as Google uh, digitizes more university libraries. And they're doing Wisconsin, and the Historical Society is not directly connected with the university library, but it's affiliated with it, and so they will 
eventually be getting to those. They haven't cataloged these things with cards, so every time I check a new one out, they have to go through a whole cataloging thing. But there are a dozen or more of them that have been cataloged now that you can find. Uh, one of the things that is in some of the reports are the courses that are given to teachers in normal schools. And it's all, almost all content. And it's content of school mathematics. And if you look at arithmetic textbooks from the 1880s and 1890s, you're surprised at how good they are. You have to read them carefully to realize that. Because people say they're just procedures. And there are procedures there, but the procedures come at the end of sets of problems. Li Ping Ma told me that when she was in China, she read somewhere that the teaching of arithmetic in the United States used to be better than it is now. And she didn't remember where she had read this. She said that next time she went back to China, she'd try to find it. <laughs> she was unable to find it. But one time when she was in Madison on her way to Washington, D.C., I gave her a copy of Shelton's uh, Complete Arithmetic from around 1890. And then she flew back from D.C. to California. She lives in Palo Alto. Uh, and when she got back, she wrote me a note and she said, Dear Dick, I was right. The teaching of arithmetic was better then than it is now. It's a very good book. And it's not my favorite in that period. It's a good book, but there are better ones. She, in fact, is writing another book. Uh, I don't know when it's going to be out. I've read three chapters of it. Uh, it will be a little bit controversial, uh, but it's, what I've read so far is very good, and it may make a difference. So, and this kind of question was there in all the state standards that I've looked at. Here's another one on word analysis, vocabulary. Give the synonym of each of the following words, incursion, genuine, veracity, ability, lifeless. Explain the difference between the synonyms, should any exist. <coughs> is this just a matter of rote memorization? And the answer is no. There's one section out of 20 that deals with methods of teaching. Here are two questions. What is your method to teach children to discontinue the sing-song or monotonous tones, which many require in reading. Is this method original with yourself? I mentioned this in a paper uh, that I wrote a few years ago and said, I wish I had been taught that because my wife can tell you how abysmal my reading of books to our children was when I got started. <laughs> I learned, but you have to learn and it can be taught. And I wasn't taught. <laughs> And then this one, Sholman mentions, how do you interest lazy and careless pupils? Answer in full. <laughs> the difference is when Sholman put it in, he put an exclamation point after the answer in full. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know the answer that was directed yet? Here are the topics that were used. They're not quite the ones that Shulman mentioned, he mentioned them from the first page of this three-year thing. I mentioned them at the beginning of one of those years. They changed a little bit. There were three of them that were worth 100 points each. The whole thing was worth 1,000 points. Written grammar was one of those. Uh, arithmetic and reading was the third. They were worth 100 points. You know how much grammar is worth now in tests? You know how much grammar is taught? Not very much. <laughs> unless you teach a foreign, unless you take a foreign language, and then maybe you get some grammar. Written grammar, spelling, arithmetic, history of the United States, theory and practice of teaching, mental arithmetic, geography, physiology, algebra, natural philosophy, which is really physics, penmanship, natural history, reading, vocal music, word analysis which is really definitions and then a good bit more. Composition, drawing, constitution of the United States and of California, school law, and oral grammar. 
Here's part of what Shulman wrote about them, <coughs> about then and now, meaning the middle of the 1890s for now. The emphasis on the subject matter to be taught stands in sharp contrast to the emerging policies of, of the 1980s with respect to the evaluation of testing of teachers. And then he goes on to mention what was going to be used to test teachers in a state where he was asked to help and to look at what they were doing. Organization and preparing and presenting instructional plans, evaluation, recognition of individual differences, cultural differences, understanding youth, management, educational policies and procedure. And then he says, where did the subject matter go? What happened to the content? And then he explains a little bit in their necessary simplification of the complexities of classroom teaching. And it is complex, there's no question about that. Investigators ignored one central aspect of classroom life, the subject matter. Pedagogical content was given as the name of a combination of subject matter knowledge and pedagogy. And that was picked up by many in the education uh, community as the focus of Shulman's talk. And that was a good bit of the focus of the talk. But it wasn't where he started. He started with content. And then he was assuming that content would be solid. And then you talk about pedagogical content. But you have to have the content before you can start talking about the knowledge that you have for, for teaching it. Now, I want to illustrate a little bit about the problems that we have with respect to content. I joined the Wisconsin uh, Mathematics Council, the state version of associated with the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, oh, 18 or so years ago. And about five years ago, there was an article in the triennial publication they have on rational numbers. A fifth grade teacher who was a board member of the Wisconsin <coughs> Council had been to a summer program on developing mathematical ideas. There's a whole series of books on that, and so you can actually read the kind of thing that they do in this program. Uh, and she'd gone to one on rational numbers. Rational numbers are fractions, two-thirds, four-fifths, things like that. And was so impressed by what she'd learned that she wrote an article to share this knowledge with other teachers. Unfortunately, she hadn't learned very much. <laughs> And she also went to, on the web and found a website in Oswego, New York that was bad and she made it even worse. <laughs> when you go and look at the website, you see that she's copied a number of things directly from that, but she didn't understand some of the things as to what was uh, really happening. She didn't understand the difference between a definition and a theorem. And that's a vital distinction. Teachers need to know that. First column had something like 10 mathematical errors. I wrote the editor and pointed this out to her. Uh, and she wrote back and said, would you write an article correcting them? And I said, no. <laughs> That's the responsibility of the Wisconsin Math Council. I'll help behind the scenes, but my name won't be used. So an article appeared. I'll mention one of them uh, in just a little while. Uh, six months later, I wrote her. We were on our way to Singapore for a meeting, and I thought I'd find out uh, how many other people had written in to point out errors in this article. <laughs> and so I asked, you're right. <laughs> Somebody said, <laughs> zero, <laughs> and the answer was nobody. Two weeks after this article had appeared, we got the newsletter from the Wisconsin Math Council, and there was an article about the presidential award-winning elementary school teacher from Wisconsin in mathematics, an award that's given every two years in, up to then, every state, but not since then in every state. Uh, 
and she was the award-winning elementary school teacher in Wisconsin. When I found out about this, I wrote a friend in, who had been in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Department of Education. She's no longer there, but she had contacts. And I said, would you like to see the article <laughs> and share it with people in the U.S. Department of Education so that embarrassing moments like this won't happen? They've changed the criteria a little bit for that. They want some evidence now. Wisconsin, by the way, two years later, didn't get one for elementary math, along with three other states. So it had a little bit of impact. So what was the error? What was one of the errors? And this is an error that's not only in this article, but elsewhere. A rational number is defined to be a whole number divided by another whole number. Two-thirds minus four-fifths, 27 thirds, that's the same as nine. Uh, those are rational numbers, and that's the definition of a rational number. You can show that the decimal expansion of every rational number ultimately repeats. And you can also go the other direction, that if you have a decimal expansion, and eventually it starts to repeat and does it forever, then you can turn that into a fraction, rational number. She took that property of rational numbers as the essential property. And then she started talking about irrational numbers. She said, rational numbers are called nice numbers and irrational numbers are called, uh, called finite numbers and irrational numbers are called infinite numbers. Never heard that. Uh, she said square root of two is irrational because its decimal expansion never repeats. And that's in some textbooks. Uh, you can, in fact, prove that, but it's a complicated argument. But there's a translation of a Japanese series of books, seven, eight, and nine at the University of Chicago School of Mathematics Project, translated and published and then 10 and 11 that they translated that the American Mathematical Society published. Because UCSMP wasn't able to sell the ones uh, that they had published themselves enough. And in eighth grade, there's a proof that the square root of two is irrational. And it's well within the capabilities of late middle school, early high school students prove that the square root of two is irrational, and you do not do it by showing that the decimal expansion doesn't repeat. It's the kind of argument that you want students to learn how to do. Uh, so. Now, what do we use for teachers now? We use two things. We use a praxis test, and then for uh, master teachers is what it used to be called. Now it's called board certified teachers. We have National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. And the, one of the three papers that's listed uh, on the web for this meeting, uh, and that one is available on the web uh, at an MSRI, Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. If you just type the title, you'll probably be led to that. Uh, I give some examples of uh, national board questions as well as praxis questions and corresponding questions from the 1870s and 1880s. And the one from the 1870s and 1880s are much more challenging than what we're asking now, both on praxis and for national board. And remember, those were taken by people who were basically just out of high school, not just out of college. Here's an example of a question asked in Michigan in 1990 and praxis question. Praxis question. All of the following river valleys are densely populated except the Yangtze, the Amazon, the Nile, or the Indus. You don't have to know much to know that the Amazon is the right answer for that. There's jungle around there. Here's Michigan. For grammar school teachers. This one was for middle school teachers. Why do we find so few railroads in South America? <coughs> Jungles and mountains are the reason, isn't it? 
It's a much better question. Here's a marvelous example of the difference. Sample praxis question. They give four lines of how a dictionary would tell you how to pronounce letters. And so that when they give a, the word, then they give you a, a pronunciation guide for it. And then they said, according to the pronunciation guide about which of the following words would be represented as, and then there's that, telepathy. Well, there's no L in this, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Telegraphic, there's no L. Topographer, there's no R at the end. Did you need any of that information at all to answer this question? <laughs> well, here's what was asked in the 1870s. Indicate by the exact means employed in the dictionary the pronunciation of the following words. Jugular, granary, raspberry, cramptory, stalwart, blatant, glamour, synconia, despicable, and gondola. You may not even remember what synconia is. It was important then, and it's still important. Uh, it's the tree, the quinine comes from the bark. And it was relatively new then. <coughs> Let me give you an example of something that appeared in the mathematics teacher, NCTM is high school. This was written by a high school math teacher and a high school English teacher. We're trying to try to figure out how you could get students to understand something. You don't need to know what the trigonometric functions are, but there are functions that come up in triangles or are on the circle. There are examples of periodic functions when you're dealing with periodic phenomena. Trigonometric functions are what you usually use to model it. A trigonometry teacher can use a graphing calculator in teaching identities. These equations can be used. R is sine of 2x and S is 2 sine x. Have students graph R and S. They're two different graphs. The two aren't the same. Next, have students graph R and T. T is twice sine x cosine x. And those two graphs, in fact, are the same. And there's nothing wrong with that up to that point. But this is what they say next. The students are now learning identity, not by the rote method of paper and pencil, but by experiencing and seeing the identity. There's no mathematical idea there at all. And there are very simple ways of doing it. I got so angry about this, I wrote to the president and the uh, past president of NCTM and, and said, this is not what your standards are supposed to mean. Would you or get somebody else to write an article pointing this out? And when nothing happened in 15, 18 months, uh, I wrote myself and wrote an article explaining what was happening and how you could actually show that those are the same. And then after doing that, then extending it to find the formula for sine of x plus y, which is the, the crux of trigonometry. They wouldn't consider it as an article because then the authors wouldn't have a chance to rebut what I said. So it got considered as a letter and it got turned down. <laughs> because all I did was complain, I didn't do anything. <laughs> About six or seven years later, the argument that I used was published by somebody else, and I was very happy it was there, but this is the kind of advice that teachers are getting. Now, we're going to be looking at exams. I can only give you some suggestions about mathematics. <clears throat> we were in Japan in 1987, and I asked a friend in Sendai, Tohoku University, north of Tokyo, a few hours by train. Uh, if you could give me some examples of entrance exam questions for Japanese universities. When we got back, we were gone for the semester. There in the mail was a book that's published annually of entrance exams to universities plus the national exams. I was just bowled over. I don't read Japanese, but there are enough <laughs> figures there and the mathematics that I, I just... Uh, and talking to people, uh, if I wanted some of these things translated out 
and the Mellon Foundation was able to provide funding for translation and distribution to all members of the Mathematical Association of America. I hope this might wake people up. It didn't, but. But one of the things that I learned from it is how the Japanese ask questions for a machine graded exam for college entrance. Now this is not like the SAT, it's like the, the subject matter uh, in mathematics part. But in fact in Japan it's treated as, it, as the SAT math part. What they have, it's like uh, ETS's gridded response, except it's a little bit easier to work with than that. Every number that you're going to fill in and six questions to do in an hour. We ask 60 questions or 50 questions to do in an hour. There's a difference between one-step questions and multi-step questions. They probably will rank people about the same way, but the level of knowledge that you need to do multi-step questions is much deeper than what you need to do one-step questions. And what they do is they break down the question into parts. You don't have to solve it in the order in which they do tell you. And some of them I didn't when I worked all of these. Uh, but then you have to go back and fill in the other parts. And so say the answer here would be 4 over 7. Can you zoom that in a little? Yeah. It's not important, really. What they have is, let me read it here. They have a number inside a brace. And on the answer sheet, they would have six for the number. And next to six, they would have zero, one, two, three, up to nine. And then they would have plus and minus sign. So if the answer was going to be four over seven, they would have six and then divided by seven. And next to six, you would <coughs> mark off four and next to seven, you'd mark off nine. And if it was minus two-thirds, they would have two things up top and one down below. So you could do 14 thirds, but you could also do minus two-thirds. That question uh, to uh, divide 88 into two parts that are to each other is two-thirds is to four-fifths. If you gave four possible choices for the first number, then you get the second number just by subtracting from 88, and then you just divide and see which comes close enough to what that ratio is going to be without having to, to do that. And students also often have calculators on these exams. But if you asked at this form, you'd have, say, AB divided by CD. And next to A, you'd have to put a 4, and next to B, you'd put a 0. Mark that on your sheet. So it's machine gradable, but not multiple choice. And it's a marvelous way of extending the level, the range of problems that you can ask. Because there are many problems that are asked in mathematics that you can answer just by throwing out three of them, by checking that they don't satisfy the conditions that are there, without knowing how to solve it. But asking it this way, you have to know how to solve it. Because the, the the range of choices that you have is so much greater that you're not going to have time to go through all of them. Now, this one probably won't show up because it's too small, but Shiga University is the main university in a prefecture in Japan. It's the sister state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And there is an entrance exam, not for the whole university, but for different faculties. And for Shiga, they gave the entrance exam for education and uh, information technology. And this included elementary, secondary, and information sciences. One of the questions, it's number two right here, <coughs> A is a two by two matrix. Doesn't matter that you know what a matrix is. B is another two by two matrix, and there's a way of multiplying them. A times B, and B times A. And in general, for these things, A times B is not the same thing as B times A. The question that's asked 
you're given for A, four numbers, and for B, you're given two numbers and two letters. And you're asked to find those two letters so that A plus B quantity squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Now, if you just take those matrices and square them and put it all and work it all out, it's a messy problem. And it looks just like a procedural problem. <clears throat> but if you realize that A squared plus 2AB plus B squared is A plus B quantity squared only if A times B is B times A, then all you have to do is multiply A times B and B times A and equate what's happening and you get two simple equations to solve for those two unknown letters. And so it's a, it's a conceptual problem, really. The problem is that if you're looking at this as a psychometrician, <coughs> you're just looking at the results that people are getting and not looking at what's really going on. As Bill Schmidt said at a meeting in Chicago a few years ago, we've got to get cut way down, he actually said get rid of, but cut way down on the, um, on the effect of psychometricians on these tests. And he said, I'm a psychometrician and I'm saying that. You have to get content people involved. So that we have questions like this that require some understanding. Now I want to close with two things that are related. The first is a problem that I would give in the course in arithmetic for homework. I would ask students to take the number nine. I'm going to illustrate it with six rather than nine because that the numbers get too large on uh, the number of. As for homework, what I want you to do is to write out all the ways that you can write nine as a sum of whole numbers. So seven plus two is one way. It could be six plus two plus one. We're not going to consider 7 plus 2 and 2 plus 7 is different because if you had a log that's 9 feet long and you cut off 2 feet at one end, it doesn't matter whether you cut it off one end or the other end. And so they would do that for homework. There are about 30 of them. And I'd ask somebody the next class period to put them on the board and they would put them on in a random fashion. And I would ask, are you sure you've got all of them? And is it possible you've got something there twice? Because you've got so many things there, it's hard to compare them all. And if I ask you to do this for 30, do you think your chances of getting all of them in a random fashion are any good or not? <laughs> well, they all admitted no. If we got up to 30, I'm just not going to be able to do them this way. So there has to be a, have to look for a systematic way. And that was the point, point of the problem. So after a while, they would come up with doing this, 6, 5 plus 1, 4 plus 2, 3 plus 3, etc. And I said, have you ever seen anything ordered this way? Like stairs. And I said then, uh, not numbers, because you won't have seen numbers ordered this way, but anything else ordered this way. Still blank said, okay, take a book out, and then once you open it to the index, and look carefully at the index. And after a couple of minutes, somebody says, it's just like alphabetical ordering. I said, yes. If six is A, and five is B, and so on down the line, here are the numbers up top written in alphabetical order. That's what it is, isn't it? Now, we don't call this alphabetical ordering because we reserve alphabetical ordering for letters. But when something occurs often enough, and this type of ordering occurs often enough in mathematics, we give it a name. And so I would ask, uh, and say, when there are enough people who have a profession or an avocation, a word is coined for that. And one place where this alphabetical ordering is used regularly is in dictionaries. And there's a name given to people who write dictionaries. And I wonder if you know what, that, what people who write dictionaries are called. And they never know the answer. Lexicographer. Lexicographer. We call this lexicographical ordering. 
So the last time I taught that course before I retired, I decided I'd lead it up to its full length. And I'd give them something that I was pretty sure that they could answer. So after all these other things I said, and I said, for example, there's a name that's given to people who study birds. I wonder if you know what that is. And there was silence for a little while, and then somebody said, aren't they ophthalmologists? <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's close. <laughs> now the point of that, and this you won't be able to read, so I will tell you what it says. The University of Wisconsin has on the web grades given by all the courses at the University of Wisconsin by sections. The average grade given in curriculum instruction to undergraduates that take their, their courses is almost always over 3.9. Are those students 3.9 students? No. And now my question that I ask you as members of the School of Education is, what can we do about that? Do you know what department gives the lowest grades in the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin? Math. No, math isn't there. And the, the <coughs> methods math course will often have sections that have a 4.0 average. <laughs> Physical education gives the lowest grades. <laughs> I close with that. <laughs> But I'm really serious. I want some. Uh, I gave a talk at the Madison Literary Club. And you can go to Google and type ASCII, and then you can type Madison Literary Club talk, and you will get a one page thing. If you click at the beginning, uh, then you'll get the whole title. It's, a, it's on our website, actually. Oh, you, you put the, yeah. the URL on? Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you just type uh, uh, in Google ASCII Mad Lit Talk, then it comes up with that paper. It's a 10-page paper where I give many examples of the difference between practice questions, national board questions, and questions, and something I would dearly love to have happen. I've written some on what happens in mathematics then and now. I would like people in history and people in English to do the same thing, because the contrasts are at least as great as they are in mathematics. Yes? This, this is kind of an obsession of mine that I, I would put behind it, and people from my field, my original field, constantly complain about how we the voters are, but we haven't really tried to do anything to correct it. And, and so I, the, the, the sort of broad question I would have is, what could policymakers do that would in some ways encourage people from subject matter disciplines to get more involved in, in standard setting of, within both teacher training and within K-12. And are there any models for that? Because I haven't, I think there's some in Europe, I haven't seen them here. Massachusetts and the mathematics one, Wilfred Schmidt at Harvard got involved uh, when uh, a, a draft was written that just wasn't mathematically coherent. And Massachusetts has a quite reasonable set of mathematics standards. But if I'm a state legislator, how can I do something to make that happen or encourage that? Or, or is there anything? Middle school has been a disaster area for a long time. Martin Meyer's book, <coughs> Schools, written in the early 60s, contrasted American education with French education. And he pointed out that historically in the United States, grammar school went through grade eight, but not everybody learned at the same rate. And so the students that were slower were given seventh and eighth grade to catch up with the other students so that they would be ready for the higher intellectual level that high school was. And then people started coming up with explanations for why not much was learned in middle school. And they said it was hormones. <laughs> in France, the age of our junior high school students, in seventh and eighth grade, uh, was the period where they piled on the work. And the students learned an enormous amount. 
And then the next two years after that, they learned next to nothing. <laughs> and they said it was hormones. <laughs> it's not biologically determined, it's culturally determined. In Wisconsin, uh, when the licensing was set up for teachers uh, a few years ago, a revised version, content people were never considered uh, and consulted. There was no uh, middle school mathematics requirement. We have a K-8 certification, we have a 7 to 12. In Madison, there are 11 middle schools, and I think there are six middle school teachers that are uh, 7 to 12 certified. <laughs> the principals like elementary certified teachers because they have more flexibility in, in moving them around. And policy people can get involved. I started having a specialist math teacher who taught nothing but math in seventh in fifth grade. Our children didn't start it until seventh grade because even when they started middle school, the sixth graders were still sixth grade teachers were still teaching everything. State legislation legislators ought to be concerned about questions like that. When do you start having specialist teachers? I once asked Edie Hirsch. When should we start having specialist math teachers? And I prefaced it by saying the most important thing you teach children in the first two years of school is how to learn to read. And that can probably be better done having the same teacher teach the children all day because then they can work on reading, not just in reading, but in other subjects. And recall that Hirsch was a professor of English at Virginia, and his reply was, in math, we have to start in first grade because the knowledge of teachers is so poor that until we get a cohort that's gone through a, a decent program, we have to do specialized work. I'm not sure that that's necessary, but we have to work so that first grade teachers know more than what they do. So I don't have simple answers. If there were simple answers, but there are some things that people ought to be asking serious questions about that I think are appropriate. I think it's inappropriate for state legislators to be micromanaging the school system. But there are general policy questions I think that they should be asking. Other? Yes? In Arkansas right now, we're looking at, uh, we just got our results on this new Algebra 2 in the course exam. We've given it twice now. It's called okay. the American I know it. I, I looked at, not, I was not in the first group of the people that helped write it, but okay. I was on the review committee okay. uh, for the, the final look at it beforehand, so I know the, what's the, on it. The goal was supposed to be just to, to yes. more in-depth kind of questions in mathematics that as compared to the ACT or even the state level exams. Well, the, what, we're, what we're finding out is happening, but basically it came back saying that less than 20% of our students are ready for college algebra. Um, compared to the ACT, which says you need an eight, uh, 22 on the ACT, ACT would say, closer to 40 percent of our students are ready for college algebra that's a, there's a pretty big difference there but the, where the ACT is able to spread out student scores in math we have we don't seem to be having a, a big uh, a maxed out problem everybody making a 36 in math in on ACT so how what do we do now that we know that most of our students are clustered here at the bottom of this algebra 2 exam how, how does that help us know anything about kids in college except that they're all how is that beneficial? You need better textbooks starting early. And you need teachers that have better content knowledge. And you have to work at it. And you have to work at both. Yes, Jay. Um, I was just going to ask about, um, in Fayetteville, uh, the elementary school textbook is everything than math, and I was wondering if you could comment on what you thought about that. Uh, everyday math is a spiral program, where they deal with it a little bit, and then they come back the next year, and they come back the next year. The recommendations in the National Math Panel is that that's not the right way to do it. <coughs> what, why is that? Because you don't, and East, Far Eastern, uh, uh, East Asian countries don't do it that way. Every year there's progression, and you learn what you're learning that year, and then you build on it. Something that I would like to see happen, 
and happens in many countries, is students own textbooks. So that they have last year's textbook, so the next year's textbook doesn't have to have a, a fifth of the book, a, a review of the previous year's work. Uh, we need to cut out many of the pictures that are in the textbooks that are totally irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> there are some books from Singapore that are in English that are available in this country, um, www.singaporemath.com. Uh, make sure the university library has a copy and it's worth getting as long as you happen to have children yourself. But just take a look at them. You can go on their website and see some sample pages. The illustrations are illustrations of children with a little <coughs> balloon above them with a, a, a content-related copy uh, message for what's going on right there. Now, I have to also give a disclaimer on this, and that is I'm helping the, the people on SingaporeMath.com uh, with the U.S. editions. I don't get royalties on it, but I do get uh, periodic money from them. But if I didn't feel it was good, I can't comment on some of the U.S. programs because I'm on uh, an advisory panel of a study that the U.S. Department of Education is funding of four elementary school uh, curricula that are uh, being used in uh, Title I schools. Neither of those two programs are in the, the study. Yes? Uh, I'm James Schultz, a PhD student in education policy. And you had mentioned that we need to increase the content knowledge of teachers. Um, so I guess my question is, what do you think is one of the best ways to do that? Do we marry our ed schools to uh, to mathematics departments or you know the letters, arts and sciences? Do we do we increase the amount of courses they take in those departments? Do we raise admission standards, um, or do schools need to start uh, having more alternative certification where they're able to hire mathematicians to teach mathematics? I mean, the combination of all three. Mm -hmm. There isn't just one thing that you do. Uh, there's a lot to be said for alternate certification, provided that there is some serious work with the people that are being involved, and you don't just throw people into a classroom without uh, them having some prior knowledge of what's going to happen, so that they're not too surprised, and some advice on what to do with some of the problems that are going to arise. Um, but getting people who have better content knowledge is clearly an, an important thing. It's not the whole thing. Content knowledge by itself won't suffice. There's a book by an Israeli mathematician, Ron Aharoni, called Arithmetic for Parents. Your library doesn't have it, and it should. He was asked about six years ago to teach, no, actually a little more than that, about eight years ago, to teach elementary school in a kibbutz in northern Israel, a, a poor kibbutz. And he asked a number of people, uh, should I do it? And everybody said, don't do it, you'll be wiped out. And he said, if I had any sense, I would have followed that advice and I would have missed the most fascinating learning experience of my life. And after about five years, he wrote a book in Hebrew, and then it was translated uh, into English. There's an article he has, an American educator. Uh, it was published by a private firm that was set up by a math professor at Berkeley. It has the most interesting name for a publishing firm that you can imagine. Sumizdat, S-U-M-I-Z-D-A-T. <laughs> now, Samizdat was the word that was used in Russia for self-publishing. But in the West, we thought of it as clandestine publishing because if you got caught with one of these books, you might end up in a gulag. So he changed this SAM to SUM. So this is sort of clandestine mathematics. <laughs> the first book he published was a translation of a great Russian geometry book from the 19th century by Kisilev. And that's another book that the library ought to have. And I've mentioned that to the mathematicians. And there's the, the second volume of that now in solid geometry that he's also translated out. 
Uh, that's a, a book that you can recommend to people. Leaving Ma's book ought to be in every school in the state. So that people have some idea of what it means to know mathematics as a teacher. You have to realize, though, that the phrase that Leaping uses, their found understanding of fundamental mathematics, is not something that you can teach to teachers in college. About a tenth of the Chinese teachers that she interviewed had what she called a profound understanding of fundamental math. And they all got it after years of teaching where they would not teach the same course every year. They would rotate. And sometimes do four, five, and six, maybe do four, five, six again, and then go back and do one, two, and three. I had a teacher that taught me for first, second, and third grade. And did she know enough mathematics? Well, yes. Uh, I was walking by the math room on the second floor once, and I saw a symbol that I didn't recognize. It was a square root sign. It was probably third grade, because I knew addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division well. But this was new. And so I asked her what this was, and she told me what it was and told me how to compute it. She didn't explain why it worked, because by then the explanations that were in the old textbooks were gone. But in 1900 and 1880, there were beautiful pictorial explanations for what's happening. It's just with numbers, but it's generic numbers. And you look at what's happening, and, and that's what you're doing in general. Uh, so getting better textbooks, getting more knowledge. I was once asked to, to talk in the graduate seminar in math education about some of the NSF-funded curricula. I talked about one of them. They were studying them that semester, and the, the teacher liked them all, maybe not all of them equally, but, uh, uh, and there was some controversy about it. And I talked about one of them that was being used in Milwaukee in high school, and mentioned how they treated the factor of a third for the volume of a pyramid, a third the area of the base times the height. Uh, it used to be treated in seventh, seventh or eighth grade by pouring sand into pyramids. And then in high school, they would give a, an honest mathematical treatment. Uh, this in ninth grade, which was the only treatment of volume in the whole high school program, they started off with data and used the regression feature of a calculator to come up with a linear model. And I said, now, I want to ask a question. And I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I want you to all close your eyes. And if you know a mathematical reason why there's a factor of a third for the volume of the pyramid, I want you to raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I won't call on you to explain it. I just want an honest answer. Nobody. These are people working for a PhD in mathematics education at the University of Wisconsin, and most of them were former high school teachers. I rest my case. We not only need more knowledge for teachers, we need more knowledge of mathematics in the mathematics education community. Yes, I'm going to have to quit in just a little while because we've got to get to the airport, but I'll take a few more questions. Well, all right, we'll see the last two then. Okay. Um, in your paper about it's uh, good intentions are not enough. Okay. You mentioned Project 2061, is that right? And they evaluate, uh, or this group evaluated some textbooks. Yes, this group didn't include any mathematicians in their evaluation. What would be different if we included mathematicians in those evaluations? What do you see as important when you're evaluating them? Uh, if I said there were no mathematicians involved, I was a little bit wrong. I, there was one mathematician that I know who was involved in it. And she told me what they evaluated. They took three topics, and they had about a week, two weeks at most, to look at the books and evaluate it on that. If you're going to evaluate uh, a middle school set of textbooks, you have to do more than three topics and you have to do more than that amount of time. If I had been involved, I would have complained bitterly that this is a totally irresponsible. There was a review by the U.S. Department of Education uh, on, in terms of these expert panels of mathematics books. And there were five expert panels set up in different areas. Only in mathematics was there a protest about what happened. They brought 92, no, let's see, 
72 people together in Washington, D.C. No, it's was, it was 96. It was supposed to be 96, but one hadn't been able to make it, one mathematician from Oklahoma, uh, because of weather that had hit there. And the guidelines that were set up were set up in such a way that they didn't seriously get at what the content was, and I objected at the meeting. I was the one mathematician out of that group. It was currently active as a mathematician. There was one other who had a PhD in math, applied mathematics, but he'd been doing education policy work uh, out in California for a long time. And friends out in California said he'd been a real problem. <laughs> uh, he's no longer alive. So, um, I got copies of the reviews of the programs under Freedom of Information Act after 10 of them were listed as exemplary or promising, five each, and then two were added later, and I got those also. Each one of those was reviewed by four people. So there were 48 reviews of the programs. There wasn't a single review that mentioned an error in the books that were involved. I can't tell you which programs I reviewed because of confidentiality, but I can tell you it wasn't one of those 12 because I listed all sorts of errors in both the series that I looked at. Why should we mention errors? The publishers are going to get uh, feedback on this. They get the reviews. And having errors pointed out to them should be useful because they can then fix them. Teachers should be, when they're finding errors in textbooks, should be writing the publisher, or writing the authors. I do that regularly. And sometimes the next edition comes out with the same error. And then I write again and they say, oh, well, that sort of got missed. Well, <laughs> the second time I go public on it, the first time I don't. <laughs> so there are all sorts of things that people can do, but people have to start acting responsibly. That example that I mentioned of the article in the Wisconsin Teacher of Mathematics with 10 errors in the first column, I don't know which is worse. The fact that the Wisconsin Math Council didn't have enough contact in the salary community so that they could get the paper reviewed competently and have it changed to a reasonable paper that might be useful. As it was, it wasn't. Or, the fact that nobody in the state except one mathematician pointed out. Teachers are busy, but we have an awful lot of math educators in the state, the colleges around the state, and they ought to be keeping an eye on what's happening in their own state. And then the third thing is, this was the presidential award winning teacher. Now I tried to do a little something about that, and I think I've done a little something, probably not enough. but. There are all sorts of systemic things that are falling between the cracks. And in schools of education, you ought to be telling teachers that they can help improve the quality of textbooks by giving the publishers and the authors feedback on what doesn't work, where there's a problem. I've been working with the daughter, two daughters of a friend. And one of them is using a particular algebra book, first year algebra book. And she was over and there was a problem in it. Problem involving solving a linear equation that had decimal coefficients. And they gave the suggestion of multiplying by 10 or multiplying by 1,000. Now, multiplying this one by 100. And it would make sense to multiply by 10 or multiply by 1,000, but it doesn't make any sense at all to multiply that one by 100 because it just doesn't change the problem the way it should be changed. So I wrote the author and, and said, why? I mean, and he wrote back and he said exactly that reason. In the teacher's edition, we have comments of the, uh, why these are in inappropriate and why you should multiply. So I asked the father of these two girls, uh, if one of the daughters, and he said, well, there's a go to school night. I'll talk to the teacher. So he talked to the teacher and the teacher said, well, that's just an error. Um, hadn't even looked at the teacher's guide. 
but the people who are writing this ought to know that the teachers are too busy to look at the teacher's guide for every problem. <laughs> I mean, we want some competence, basic, simple competence, and we're not getting it. Thank you. I think I will hold my question. <laughs> <laughs>